Good evening. Welcome to tonight's show. With me is Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Mr. Lawrence Wong. Thank Good you for evening. joining us. Joining us also are six fellow Singaporeans. They will take turns to sit across us, like you guys here at the table, two at a time. We're going to start off with Nicole Ng. You are co-founder of the Food Bank Singapore, a registered IPC, and Shamir Rahim, founder and group CEO of Versa Fleet. Yeah. Welcome, guys. Uh, DPM, before I let them get cracking at you, mm -hmm. I'm going to take my chance to sure. ask you a question too. Because Fire budget, away. budget 2023 has been said to be very generous. You have said it was supposed to be a Valentine's Day present anyway. So uh, some commentary out there is saying perhaps it's too generous. Have we uh, tried to insulate Singaporeans from the realities out there in the world? Are we sort of uh, uh, spending money when perhaps we should be saving instead? Sure. Well, I'm, it's interesting that you say it's too generous. I'll be very curious to see what our other guests here today think of the budget because there are also many segments of society who constantly ask the government to do much more. So really, the budget is always a balancing exercise. And this, in this year's budget, it was particularly challenged to, challenging to find the right balance uh, because we do want to get back on track to a balanced budget position after having spent so much during the pandemic. But at the same time, we know that the economy is weak, there are downside risks, and people do need help with cost of living pressures. So we want to do something to spend to help them, because if we were to taper down and reduce spending too much, then I think you will not be able to do enough to help Singaporeans. Uh, at the same time, if you spend too much uh, you have the concerns that, Steve, yeah. you just raised. And also, you may inadvertently stimulate demand and cause inflation to be worse. Mm. So it really was a balancing act. And in the end, we focused our spending. A lot of the measures were focused on the lower income families, which I'm sure Singaporeans will appreciate need more help. Mm -hmm. and to make sure that they are able to cope with the increases in prices. Yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, that balance is often the biggest challenge, you know, mm -hmm. because if you give more here, you've got to take from somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. Well, challenges is the topic of our first round of conversation. And with the rise in GST since the start of the year, households and businesses have been feeling the pinch of increased costs. We met one family in that situation. Let's take a look. <music> Singapore's GST rate rose to 8% this year and will rise to 9% in 2024. But additional support has been announced in Budget 2023 that will help cushion the impact of the higher GST rates and help Singaporeans with inflation. Yusri Abdul Hamid is one of those who have felt the pinch of rising costs. He is a father of eight, and a stay-at-home dad who also looks after his mother who has dementia. His younger son, Ilham, has Down syndrome. My wife is, she's the sole breadwinner in the family. She's working as a security officer. She's uh, doing night shift, 12-hour uh, job. I'll be doing the uh, groceries on a uh, weekly basis. Now, I have to really restrain myself from all that, more veggies instead, because uh, the price of chickens are not really risen to you know, such an extent where if I buy that chicken, I wouldn't be able to get other stuff for essential daily needs. For my mom, due to her illness, uh, she, can, uh, she needs to wear her diapers. Usually it was about you know, 10, 14 dollars. Now it's risen to 24 dollars per packet, and it's only about seven piece. I believe that the government is doing whatever they can on their part and we, was rather us, each individual has their own part to play. I mean, we cannot just you know, depend on uh, help from the government. We've got to do something for ourselves. Personally, I've been living a hard life myself, so I'm just kind of used to it. I just need to you know, control myself. Don't just be too excessive in whatever. You need really to cut down on things. Wow. I mean, Yusri certainly has a lot mm. on this plate, you know, but at the same time, he realises mm -hmm. that he can't just rely on government yeah. for, for all his needs. Uh, GST vouchers, assurance package, that was only help families no. like Yusri. And, and very commendable spirit. Yes, he definitely. Wants to the, do his attitude, part too. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Nicole, you are uh, familiar with households like Yusri, right? Yep. Through your work at the food bank. Yes, we uh, we actually serve um, 370 charity organisations mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and we reach out to about 300,000 uh, people indirectly through our partners as well. And, and what do you feel are the needs there? Um, 
Actually, I think up to a couple of years ago, uh, food was never seen as a basic necessity because in Singapore, we really have the luxury of easy access to mm. very affordable food, mm -hmm. right? But I think with COVID, mm -hmm. um, everybody has seen that, you know, inflation has also hit food as well. Um, so one of the things that um, we've also observed is because through my network um, that I work with, uh, we also work with social workers. Mm -hmm. And one of the feedbacks that we have received, and this is a question that I'd like to mm. pose today, yep. is that sometimes the grant application mm. and the means testing mm. is super complicated. Is this yeah. something that the government can address to simplify the means testing? We have been doing that. Uh, Nicole, it's a very uh, uh, valid point. Mm. It's a feedback that arises from time to time, and that's why over the recent years, there's been an effort to streamline processes and to better coordinate and integrate some of them. Mm. It's largely now done through the Social Service Office or the SSO. Mm. Uh, so the SSO will be the one that coordinates at the back end. Across different government schemes, they will largely do the means testing mm. and they are conscious of the feedback and they are trying very hard to uh, streamline the processes as well. So it is happening already. Mm. I'm sure more can be done and I'm sure the officers at the SSO are doing their best. Yeah. Uh, there, there is ultimately still a need to do some means testing and still a need to make sure that we target the help to those who need it the most. Mm. The challenge is always to find mm. the most efficient way of doing it. Yeah. yeah. I, I think just to add as yeah. well, um, probably if at charities like ourselves, mm. if we are able to give feedback or help the social workers to, to give these help more easily as yeah. well, we'll be very happy to you know, yes, provide sure. and then to, yeah, because I see a lot of my social worker friends are also like being very stressed out. Mm. So I, I yeah. think, you know, collectively as a society, very we can help so. each other. Very yeah. much so. I think we welcome that participation and, yeah. and the um, support from charities mm. because you play a very critical role on the ground and the SSOs, uh, the officers at the SSO, they are not going to be able to do this by themselves. Yeah. They need to work very closely with social workers, with charities like yourselves, yeah. to be able to engage and provide for the families uh, effectively. Yeah, thank so, you. So in a way, it's better creating that link, that communication yeah. between all parties involved. So the people who really right. need help mm. get it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Shamia, you, you also volunteer and you've worked with non-profits. Uh, I mean, what are your concerns about the less privileged in our society? Mm, definitely. I think um, I particularly love the enhancements to uh, Kids Start. Mm. So I think, um, I mean, as a father of uh, young children as well, uh, you know, the cost of early childhood education can get pretty expensive, especially when offered by private operators. So I think uh, this is really important to enhance social mobility, keep that in our society. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing I do notice though, um, there are some families who are unfortunately stuck in a vicious cycle. So they have uh, medical finance situations, large families, and as much as they might want to send their children to programs like Kids Start, literally sometimes the logistics doesn't allow it. Mm. You know? So what can we do you know, uh, as a community together to, uh, you know, some measures that will help families in that situation? Well, Shamir, you have an excellent point because the, all, all the, a lot of the research shows that the child's early years are very critical in their potential in life. And therefore, we have to do everything we can to close the gap at that early stage. Kids Start is really meant before preschool even starts. Mm -hmm. right? So Kids Start, we're talking about infants. Um, and we are, we've announced in the budget that we're going to roll this out and we will cover 80% uh, of children nationwide. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, 100%, but we set for ourselves 80%, which is a real scaling up of Kids Start so that we literally put in resources to engage all uh, the families where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, so we should be able to do that and, and get that scaled up nationwide. But then after the first year, second year of the child, you really want them to enrol mm -hmm. in childcare as early as possible. And there we, we see a little bit of a gap. At the kindergarten level, when they are five and six, um, the children in lower income families, particularly in rental flats, their mm -hmm. enrolment is the same as the national average. Mm -hmm. So we've already been able to uh, in, you know, increase their enrollment and attendance. But at age three and four, it's still below. Yes. So we want them to get enrolled earlier. Mm -hmm. And part of the challenge is to make sure that there are enough uh, childcare centres nearby mm -hmm. because accessibility is an mm -hmm. issue. So we are also going to uh, put in place more childcare nice. places near where these families are located. 
Okay. But one of the challenges also is that, as you mentioned, sometimes these uh, children come from families of uh, lower wage earners. So to start off, they already are in a difficult situation. Uh, Nicole, maybe although, you can... Uh, although affordability in childcare shouldn't be a problem because we've already reduced the fees to such a great extent that it costs as little as $3 a month. Right. So any kid who wants to go to school yeah. must be able to go to school. That's what you're saying. That's right. Mm -hmm. Preschool. Preschool, I mean, okay. We, we school is not <laughs> a problem. <laughs> Kindergarten, as I said, is already getting better and better. Mm -hmm. So we're really going earlier. We're talking right. about now age 3, 4. Mm -hmm. As early as, you know, at that age. Yep. And then if they need childcare, and ideally, I think it's, uh, you know, then the parents can work yep. and then they can have their kids in a good environment mm -hmm. in full day childcare and we've made it affordable but we do need to have more places yeah. and we are working on that. So I think that's the challenge because even though the, the fees for the school, the accessibility is there, I mean some of them in their circumstances, I mean Nicole, I was coming to you because mm -hmm. you uh, the family business ex Ing, you also have workers who are in the lower wage uh, bracket, you know, mm. and, and you feel that it's also about helping them earn more, right? Yeah, I think Earning more is just one, but um, the sense of passion towards mm. their job, mm -hmm. right? And now with tech, and mm -hmm. when we were all involving yeah. tech and everything else, I yeah. mean, <laughs> Shamir is in tech yes. himself. Um, with tech replacing a lot of the regular jobs yeah. already, I, I, I guess one question would be, how do you think the progressive wage can actually help these people yeah. to adapt or to want to improve themselves so that they continuously climb up the, the income ladder, as we say, and all of us progress you know, mm. upwards as well? The tech, I don't think tech will remove jobs entirely. Yeah. Uh, because Singapore will always be a market where, and Shamil can attest to this, and all the business <laughs> people later on can attest to this, where we are extremely labour tight. Yeah. We need workers. So the question is really more of, as the, the point you mentioned, Nicole, passion mm. and matching of the job to the individual's aptitude and fit and, and, and competencies and abilities. Mm. Uh, and if they find a good fit, hopefully they will feel engaged yeah. They will keep on learning and progressive wages will help tremendously because the whole idea of progressive wages mm. is to help them reskill, upskill along the career ladder and their wages keep on going up. To, to illustrate, we talked about lift technicians. Mm. It's an area that we do need more people to work in. Um, a few years ago, the starting salary for a lift technician was $1,300. Mm. I think it's too low. Mm -hmm. uh, with progressive wages, it's now 1800 And in time to come, we are aiming to get it to $2,000. Mm -hmm. But it's not simply a matter of saying, just raise the wages, because mm -hmm. we are training the lift technician with better skills mm -hmm. and making them more effective at their work. So that when the consumers, when, when residents pay more, because when wages go up, yeah. the cost of servicing the lift must go up. Yeah. But when you pay more, you feel assured that you are also getting better service and yeah. hopefully your lift will break down less frequently. <laughs> yeah. and, and you know, DPM, if I may add, because I serve a lot of hospitality yes. clients, yeah. I think um, it's that sense of pride in Absolutely. the job that they take, right? In Absolutely. Switzerland, for example, yeah. like everyone is so proud of being a butler, right? Yes. But yeah. not in this part of the world. Yeah. So I think that sense of pride as well needs to be instilled in the workers that we have. That's right. Yeah. So a lot of this really comes down to mindsets mm -hmm. rather than progressive wage. Yeah. I mean, that's part of it. It's very important that they earn a decent salary. Mm. But a lot of it comes down to mindsets. It also comes down to uh, how society mm. appreciates and, and values every individual for the work that they do and for who they are. Mm. Uh, and, and it's for all of us to change our mindsets. Yeah. Yeah. For the families in particular, we are also trying to link them up, each family, uh, with a volunteer befriender. Mm. So that that volunteer befriender can be a supporter, can encourage them, can handhold them, right. and can, can, can you know, persuade them to yeah. start thinking afresh you know, about mm. the job they do, what... Yeah what are their passions and how they can start thinking about stabilising their lives. I think I know lives. what you're talking about. It's the job skills integrators, right? No, <laughs> no, 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 not that one. Okay, no, because no, that's no, a, no, later no, on, we're going to talk about that. We're talking that about too. volunteer befrienders. Okay. Yeah. No, or, actually, it's yeah. the entire ecosystem. It's, we it's, must it's, have the community there to support each other, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Okay, I have to move things along because we are running out of time. But Shamia, I know also as an employer, hmm. Uh, like CPF, we talk about raising the rates. Is that a concern of yours? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, before that, I wanted to remark, I think not just lift technicians, even software engineers. Oh, for sure. Oh, you know, <laughs> their roles are being automated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I 
Yes, you see around the world and in, in, to some extent in Singapore, some of the tech giants have started yeah, yeah, yeah. to lay off right, some of right. their software engineers and programmers. But, but frankly, if you look at particularly programmers, people who can code software mm. engineers, I would say they are still in great demand. Mm. Mm. The banks need more. That's right. uh, other companies need more software engineers. So yes, yeah. there is a little bit of a crunch, yeah. specifically in the, some of the tech giants. Mm. But in fact, the skills that we're talking about are still in high demand. Mm, agree, agree. I think it's, uh, it's probably a, you know, a short-lived uh, phenomenon. Uh, I mean, back, back to the raised salary yeah. ceilings, I was just really curious about as to the timing of it. Uh, because you know, businesses, we, we're all having to cope with, uh, yes, the GST hikes, but also uh, right, uh, electricity bills are going up. Uh, there's also rent to contend with. Mm. So as much as we want to create high-quality jobs with good salaries, right, um, what the uh, CPF raises mean is Essentially, it adds uh, overhead to a wider segment of our workforce. So from the business point of view, cash flow now becomes a bit tighter. And actually for the employees affected, the take-home pay is reduced as well. You know, so I was just wondering, uh, because it kind of flies against the uh, you know, home measures uh, to cope with increased cost of living, but now we're kind of reducing the, mm -hmm. the cash component here. Yeah. Well, I can understand why there is that concern for employers and to some extent for individuals. But we also need to look at the long term. Retirement adequacy is a very important issue. And if we don't start building up for our retirement, um, we are storing up more problems for ourselves and for society. And, and the, really, the CPF salary ceiling ought to be keeping pace with inflation. Mm. That's the right way to think about this. It's, it can't be that we set the salary ceiling at 6000 and forever it doesn't change. Because wages are going up, prices are going up, we ought to be also keeping pace with inflation. Um, but precisely because we recognise that this is not a good time to do, and so we decided to, after discussions with the tripartite partners, phase it out over quite a, <laughs> four years, so four stages. So it, it's quite... Uh, a staged process so that we can manage the impact mm. overall. Yeah, so Shamir, so you still have time to make more money to prepare for that. <laughs> I know, we need it back, you know. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> All right, we have to go for a short break. We will come back to further this discussion. So do stay tuned. When we return, we'll be talking about the future of work. Do stay with us.
According to Ramstat's 2022 Work Monitor study, 91% of Singaporean employees have indicated an interest in career learning and development opportunities. One of those is Marcella Tang. Having majored in finance, she started her career in a bank in 2019. Back in university, I mainly studied finance, economics, management and wasn't really exposed to something that I wanted to pursue, which is tech. So after working for a year, I decided to take the leap of faith and transition into a different career industry. I was concerned about the steep learning curve um, because I had no prior knowledge to data analytics. It was just a domain that I was particularly interested in pursuing as a career. The time commitment for the course was about two to three months and during weekends about three hours per session and it was time consuming where you have to allocate you know your personal time and commitment to the course. It really strengthened and developed my technical skills and knowledge which was what I was looking for and also it greatly helped me in my transition from a finance industry to a tech industry. It's one of the best decisions I've made for my career. And it's not only younger workers like Marcella who are keen to learn. According to a survey by Job Street, nearly 7 in 10 older Singaporeans are willing to be reskilled for new jobs. 55 year old Huzia Yusof is one such person. She had to look for a new job after getting retrenched in 2021. I realized that with the skills that I have, it's not current. So I decided it's time to, you know, look out for courses and see how I can complement my, you know, extensive experience in administration and events management. And, you know, obviously IT was the way to go because um, my 19-year-old son, he's an IT geek and it's kind of nice to be able to like, hey, I know this, do you know this, you know? In the beginning, I felt that I'm going to be the oldest person here, you know? Like, what if I'm not uh, in tune with the jargon that this teenagers or young adults are using. I told everyone that, hey, I'm 55 years old, you know, so be kind, you know. So. <laughs> the course did not really apply to what I'm doing right now, but it gives me that confidence that, hey, I can pick up something new regardless of age, you know, like after all, age is just a number, right? Yeah. I hope that the, you know, there's more opportunities for, um, for us to use our SkillsFuture credit. Maybe for courses where it needs additional um, um, cash top up. We should be allowed to use our CPF, for example, or there should be additional uh, funding or subsidy. So that would, would sort of uh, motivate, especially the older people like me who, who want to do something but it's very uh, hesitant because they're afraid that they would fail. And at the same time, if they fail, they don't want to lose their money. I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if she has a TikTok account, you know. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> she could be. No, oh, very just... inspiring. <laughs> but we've seen two, two Singaporeans, uh, different age groups, you know, one younger, another older, who recently went through digital reskilling. Uh, so the theme of this round of conversation is opportunities. And at the table, we have uh, Clarence Tan, your data Hello. analytics instructor at Vertical Institute, which specialises in tech courses and other in-demand skills. Sanjeev Tiwari, you are the General Secretary of the Amalgamated Union of Public Employees, and you also sit in the NTUC Central Committee. Now, uh, DPM, you mentioned the skills future ecosystem will be strengthened. One example is uh, the appointing of job skills integrators, right? Mm -hmm. So, Clarence, I'll start with you first. Marcella okay. was actually uh, a student of yours, correct? Yeah, correct. Oh, correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you have a question also related to job skills integrators. Yeah, yeah, I have. So, uh, definitely, I applaud their efforts mm -hmm. for taking the step to go to a training provider yeah, so I myself, I'm a career switcher as well. So I totally understand like how they feel, the time commitment and so on. So uh, I find that it's a great effort that they actually make the switch. Mm -hmm, sure. Every one of them come from different backgrounds, yes. different industry, different age group, mm -hmm. but they all take the first step to gain a confidence in the skills. Yeah. What did yeah. you switch from? You said you used... Uh, from, from accounting. From accounting to? To tech. Oh, yeah, yeah, brilliant. So, so I had that steep learning curve as yes, well. So okay. whatever she faced, I have faced it as well. So yeah, so uh, coming back to the job skills integrator, mm -hmm. so I kind of like the initiative because like in a way, it bridged the entities, mm -hmm. individuals, uh, 
the enterprise as well as the training providers. Yes. So I have a question more on the mechanism as yeah. well as the execution. Yeah. Like how were these job skills integrator middlemen uh, perform their job to ensure that they find the right people to obtain mm. the right skill set yeah. and eventually get the right job? <laughs> and how will this differ from the current uh, existing practice where already recruitment agencies have been already uh, scouting for talents, yep. meeting the industry sure. needs? Yeah. Well, it, it, Clarence, you, are, you, you have asked exactly the right questions and it, it is going to be quite complex because when we started out this journey of skills future, we, we, it, it has to start first of all from the employers, right? Because the employers must feel that there is a need for their workers to be trained. So we started with that in mind. Um, and when we spoke to many companies, they didn't even think about this. And that's why we had industry transformation maps. We asked employers to start thinking about how is your industry going to transform? How is your company going to upgrade and adjust to the changes in the external environment and what new skills your workers need? And then we worked with NTUC and I'm sure Sanjeev can testify or talk about that later. We started implementing company training com committees in our companies together with the unions. Then they start thinking about their future needs and what training gaps they have. Then we talk to the training providers and then the training providers come up with causes. And technically you will say, well, if that works, then what's the need for a middleman, right? Mm -hmm. Company does it, then the training provider provides the cause and everything should come together. But with, despite doing all that, uh, we've still found some gaps, uh, right? Because the, you, you find people who may not know exactly how to navigate this environment, individuals themselves not sure what causes to take. You still have provide, training providers uh, who say, well, my cause is very good, but then the company says, actually, it's not, and then they don't really uh, fit one another. So because of all these gaps, we think there's still a need for this middleman role. Uh, and we are, we are trying it out first in, in specific sectors, get some learning experience, because the devil is really in the details, the implementation details that you talked about. How is this integrator going to function? How are they going to find the right individuals? Really make sure that right. the individuals after training will get better jobs, better pay. That's the key outcome that we want the integrator to deliver. So that integrator almost needs to really get to know the person, understand that, for example, Jenny is an older worker, perhaps a course by Clarence could be good, could help her get a job at ABC Company, That's but right. making all those connections, That's right? right. And, and it, they obviously cannot work by themselves. Yeah. They have That's to right. work with training providers like yourselves. They have to work with the unions, the employers, yeah. and then bring all of it together. So what do you think, Sanjeev? Yep. Thank you, DPM. And then firstly, let me commend uh, Hoxia for that passion and al also the willingness to upgrade and go into a new domain. Yeah. And uh, as a representative of workers, as a unionist, uh, many of our uh, members, uh, actually mature members, have shared with us uh, some of these challenges. One of the things is that there's a lot of emphasis on digital transformation, use of tech uh, and new tools. And, and where the younger workers are concerned, uh, you seem to, uh, seeing them more agile, they're more adaptable. Uh, hence, they can make that change faster. From our Every Worker Conversation Matters, uh, you know, we have heard feedback from our mature workers. They want to, but they are fearful. Uh, they are scared to take on these uh, new uh, challenges that are ahead of them. Yeah. Uh, they're also wondering what kind of support or time and space uh, that they can be given. I think failure is another uh, option, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that it's on the table. Will employers be a bit more forgiving uh, mm -hmm. if they are slower, uh, if they need more support or more time? I think these are concerns that we actually hear from our mature workers. Uh, they also want to be part of this uh, career progression. Right. Uh, and they do not be stagnated uh, just because they're not making the switch. Mm -hmm. okay. But when they do try to make that switch, then what can we do together to provide that space, that uh, support to them as well? I think that's something that mature workers are yeah. also uh, right. shouting out loud in that sense. Well, thank, thank you, Sanjeev, for that, because we, we know there are genuine concerns about uh, from mature workers. Um, but and, and so we are studying what more we can do. Mm -hmm. to, to take a step back, we, everyone wants to have a better job yes. and to see themselves advancing in life. Uh, I think from a broader perspective, we are confident that Singapore can continue to grow because that's key, right? If Singapore doesn't grow, there, there won't be opportunities. Right. But because uh, if you look around the world, even though there are troubles, there are, there's turbulence, uh, I think the Singapore brand is highly regarded. Right. Uh, we are 
you know, for our honesty, our integrity, our reliability. Investors trust us, they have confidence in us. Mm -hmm. So from that broader perspective, we, we can have confidence that we can continue to grow the economy. Right. But the challenge will be from the individual point of view, the, it will keep changing. Right. There, there will be growth, there will be opportunities, but I cannot guarantee that it will be the same job. Mm -hmm. And that means that the individual has to be prepared to invest in skills upgrading, employers have to be prepared to do so. Right. And that's why we think skills future is going to be so much more critical in our next bound of right. nation building. Right. And we want to take skills future to a higher gear. Mm -hmm. uh, the job skills integrator that we've announced in the budget is just one step. Right. Uh, we are thinking hard about what other things we can do for skills future, how we can really take it to the next level, including support for mature workers that you talked about, uh, and, and really looking at it from an ecosystem point of view. It's not just about more skills future credits or subsidies. That, that's yeah. the easiest thing to yeah. do. Right. But changing mindsets, as we talked about just now, getting employers to support training right. wholeheartedly and putting the ecosystem in place, that's right. more challenging. And that's what we are thinking hard about as part of our Forward Singapore exercise. Yeah. Uh, DPM, just to follow up on that, yep. can I just, uh, you mentioned earlier about the CTCs, the company training yes. committees, uh, employers and the ecosystem coming together. So uh, just just uh, thinking out loud, uh, in that sense, you know, in the job skills integrators, how can we then also then leverage on these uh, company training committees, E2I's uh, uh, job uh, placement and uh, the training ecosystem? and then make that tighter so that mature workers uh, and, and actually workers who want to upgrade into these new domains uh, will find it easier uh, and that connectivity is more seamless in that sense. Very much. That's the whole intent, mm -hmm. that we want um, the job skills integrator to work very closely with CTCs, with mm -hmm. E2I, um, with all the different stakeholders. But the job skills integrator will be a specific appointment. Right. And we are open to whichever institution wants to play that role because the idea is I will be prepared to give more resources mm -hmm. to appoint a job skills integrator for a particular industry. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's retail or whichever industry. <laughs> this institution will play this role. We provide more resources from the government, mm -hmm. but that institution has to deliver KPIs, not mm -hmm. just more money for you right. to hire more people, but the KPI, as I said, are for the institution to work with all the stakeholders, yep. unions, employers, training providers, and make sure that the individual train gets a good job, better pay. Right. That's yeah. the key outcome. Right. Thank you, and that's integral because you guys are the guys on the ground. You know yes. these people best exactly. and what would work best for them as well. So right. that matching is very important. But we've been talking about older workers. We need to talk a bit about younger workers as well. And Clarence, yeah. I understand yeah. you have a question related to that because you have kids who are coming for coding classes too, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I, I do teach some kids coding classes Excellent. as well. And I see parents bring their kids to the class and... Uh, obviously, they are software engineers, so they had some foresight as well. <laughs> so, uh, my question will be like... For Hopefully, them. not just parents who are software <laughs> engineers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hope like more people can yes. come. Yeah, And they really learn very fast. Yeah. Like, I really am impressed by them. So, in terms of like the generational preparation, right? Like, I see that they are bringing kids to all these kind of coding classes, kind of like to prepare them for the future. Uh, will the government have like initiative like for example the job skills integrator for the younger generation so they have they have a longer runway to add that to the mm -hmm. latest development so will the government think of any of such initiative we, we are in, not quite in the same sense as a job skills integrator or you know because really you have to adapt to the children at their appropriate age <laughs> and for children at a very young age uh, I, we think what's very important, what's very important is to sort of motivate and imbue in them that, that, that strong sense of wanting to learn, that curiosity to keep on learning, that spirit of learning is so important. So it cannot be just, oh, this industry is going to be so important and therefore you prepare for that industry. Because frankly, by the time the kid is 21, mm -hmm. the industry may be a sunset industry and it will be a new industry coming up. Or even if you say, look, you learn this program like programming language now, maybe it's whatever it is today, yeah. 10 years later, there'll be a new language. So it cannot be about 
getting the child to just focus on A, B, C or this particular item, but it's, it's really about getting them to want to learn, to have that spirit of learning. And that's so important at a young age. And if they have that, uh, you know, confidence and, and ability to keep on learning, then hopefully that will put them in a much better position later in life to continue to keep refresh their skills. And will we try to provide more opportunities for these children in the sense that, so we need to give them the chance to experience, to try and, and therefore mm -hmm. to evolve because as you say, we mm -hmm. don't know what the jobs of the future are. Very much so. So, so that's what the education system yeah. is very mindful of. All our educators in schools are very mindful of that and they are constantly in, across all the different subjects that they teach, very mindful that it's not just about content and knowledge. Mm. It's really about 21st century competencies as the educators uh, uh, talk about, which is really getting them, our children to yep. appreciate the importance of learning okay. on a continual basis. Mm -hmm. Well, that is what we're going to talk about next. We want to talk about the future and the children, of course, the young ones are our future. So do stay with us. We'll be right back after the break. And welcome back. You're watching Ask the Finance Minister. Now, Budget 2023 is all about Singapore's future in a new era. And the theme of our last round of conversation is a brighter future. So let's hear from someone who is investing in better food security for that future. Take a look. John Ching is the founder and managing director of Innovate360. It has helped more than 80 food startups grow and scale into Asian markets. We started off as a food manufacturing business looking for new products that we could sell through our distribution. But at the same time, uh, we were building our new factory and we had additional space. So we thought, you know, why not rent the space to our startups? But at the same time, you know, we take their products and sell through our distribution. 
our mission was really trying to pay it forward. We need to be self-reliant and that's why the 30 by 30 goal is very important. That's something that is so relevant and so important, especially in the last couple of years. And governments are taking action. Uh, they are in investing and spending more money on agri-food tech, really because uh, everyone realizes that you know it's something that at the end of the day, you can have all kinds of tech, but you still need to eat. And the world population is still rising we should look at other opportunities where we could anchor startup innovation. For example, the R&D lab to Singapore, to use Singapore as a test bed, to use Singapore as a place where they could uh, test market the solutions before going out to bigger markets. So I think more could be focused on that, but at the same time developing the, current, the right kind of talent in STEM. So I think what our government should be looking at is to continue to work very closely with private sector because I think um, just the relying on the private sector or just the government uh, might not make sense, especially in this kind of global climate where we should spur innovation. Okay, this time at the table, I have Melvin Tan, Managing Director of Circlet Group, which provides engineering services and products. And also Emily Yap, you are a registered nurse at Alexandra Hospital and also the founder of Dunnan Youth, a volunteer group that supports seniors. And she was featured in the budget too. Yeah, yeah. she was mentioned there, that's right. But Melvin, I'm going to start with you first because sure. uh, in your own business, you are also very much into innovation. And during the budget, the Enterprise Innovation Scheme was announced. What's your take on that? Well, I felt that the uh, Enterprise Innovation Scheme is something that will really help a lot of companies. A lot of companies that want to go innovate, very often they have uh, constraints of resources. So I think it really helps. It spurs innovation. Um, however, I just have some questions about that as well because uh, beyond creating products, beyond it, <coughs> creating inventions, there is the demand side. Who is buying the innovations? Mm -hmm. So typically in Singapore for innovators, I mean, for our, ourselves, we have been uh, uh, investing in innovations for years. Mm -hmm. The problem is trying to get the products out there. Yeah. And the biggest successes we have ever had was government procurement. Mm. And uh, government procurement was where, uh, I think it was for public service, we created something to benefit the agency for cost reduction or efficiency, and in return, the government took a part of that risk. Mm -hmm. So it has created some benefits for us. My question, uh, DPM, is whether uh, more can be done by the government in terms of government procurement to spur innovation, to create opportunities for likes of Cyclac. Mm -hmm. So, Minister. Uh, thanks for the question, Melvin. The procurement has a role to play, but when government procures, the key consideration must be that we are procuring using taxpayers' monies. Uh, we must make sure that there is value for money and we are achieving the outcomes we need the procurement to achieve. Uh, so the procurement agencies must be very clear and procuring a product, what is it for? And this product must meet that purpose. And we want to be fair to all parties. We have to do it through a proper arm's length process rather than to say, look, you know, just because I think this local company needs a, needs a helping hand, therefore I favour this person as opposed to someone else. I think that would lead us down a very slippery slope of who decides and how does the government mm -hmm. uh, pick uh, its procurement partners. We don't want to do that. So we will continue to have very clear arm's length procurement. For sure, innovation would be one of the considerations in procurement. But procurement has a particular purpose and I think we should be very clear what it is. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean, but you know, spurring innovation is a separate matter. Then we, we have so many other schemes in which we can spur, motivate in, in innovation. And I, I hope, more importantly, that our firms do not rely on government procurement to yeah. be successful. Because if they do, I think we are in trouble. That's right. First of all, our market is so small and then government procurement is just a very small fraction of that market. So it's very important that our firms, if they win a government contract, very good, so much the better. But really the market for our firms, the demand that you talked about has to be international. 
Uh, yes, Minister, I totally agree with that, that point, right? It's, it's basically giving credible reference. And yeah. actually, it's through a sandboxing of like uh, innovation challenges. So where it's a competitive process where you win innovations and therefore you create a platform for these local SMEs mm. to go beyond the shores. And frankly, though the innovators that have succeeded, usually it's uh, overseas first, then they come back. But I think there's opportunity for Singapore mm -hmm. to, to provide that platform yeah. Uh, through a government procurement system. So you're asking sure. more about helping companies go further, go beyond yeah, go our beyond, shores, right? It's actually an international yeah. so, innovation for internationalization. Okay. So it's both ways. I think we have had success stories where companies succeeded, overseas come in, but we've also had many success stories where companies succeeded in the domestic market and then go yeah. out. But I would also suggest that the reference, because many SMEs say they would like to have government as a reference point so that when they go overseas, they can tell their customers that, look, I have a relationship, I've done this in Singapore and it works and that helps them to brand and to market and go overseas. That reference point doesn't always have to come through a procurement channel, That's you right. see. It is, like you say, it could be a sandbox, it could be a pilot, it could be a uh, it could be an innovation project. Yes. So it's not necessarily always through a procurement lens because, as I said just now, procurement has a certain standard, a certain requirement, a certain rigour to it. Yeah. Because we do need to ensure that when government agencies procure, they do it by, uh, with, with uh, making sure that they achieve best value for money right. for the taxpayers. Of course, because as a taxpayer, we would be looking at it that way. Yeah. But technology and innovation, very important for the world we live in today. But Emily, in the hospital, you know, tech has become come in a big way as well. But you've actually noticed that for a certain group, the seniors, that can be a bit of a challenge, right? Yes, correct. So for the healthcare sector, there are digital innovations such as the One NUHS app, mm. which is used to pay uh, online medical bills, right. review lab results, and even manage appointments. However... As a nurse, I've realised that many elderly are struggling with this rapid change in technology. You know, some of them don't even have smartphones and they have little to no digital skill. Yeah. So, moving forward, right, what are the steps that we can take in order for us to better prepare our elderly? We are doing a lot of, uh, there are a lot of programmes that we are sort of putting in place to really reach out to the elderly and get them to... A bit more familiar and to, you know, with technology, with new technology. So, uh, particularly in the last three years of COVID, we have ramped up a lot of that uh, programs. And, you know, because we've had all sorts of restrictions, it's been more difficult for people to get in touch with one another. So, some of these have helped. And you do see more and more seniors now. Um, more familiar, more comfortable with using technology. Our penetration rates for smartphones has been constantly on the rise. Many of them do have the ability to, you know, they own smartphones, but getting them to use the phones, to use the apps in the phones, well, that's another step. But increasingly, uh, even for somebody like my mother, who is um, 83 this year, um, she used to resist um, using WhatsApp, mm -hmm. she uh, because of COVID, mm -hmm. uh, ironically, because of, precisely because of COVID, she dis learned to use WhatsApp yeah. to communicate. She learned to use Zoom to communicate, and and I think in that sense we see some positive, uh, you know, developments on that front. It's a bit of a silver lining in this crisis. So we will continue to ramp up efforts uh, and get the seniors to. Do you know? Do, do not be so afraid of right. technology and and really embrace technology. And Benefit actually, from it. Actually, we all have a part to play. I mean, like you, I am tech support for my parents. <laughs> <You know? laughs> in a way, you know, WhatsApp was. Now I'm kind of thinking, I wish she didn't get WhatsApp, so I wouldn't get the ginger can cure cancer kind of messages. You know, <laughs> all sorts of things. But and, and look, CDC vouchers, right? Yeah. A lot of uh, we we went through CDC vouchers. We provided a backup manual if you need help to go to the yeah. CC. You get the paper vouchers. But more and more of them are now comfortable mm. getting the link and using the CDC vouchers mm. on the phone. I mean, let's uh, turn our attention now to talk about you know, the future of the country as we move ahead. Uh, DPM, you touched on ensuring you know, a, a lot of things. Climate resilience, one of this, ESG as well, but also a social compact you know, and sort of 
we can only move forward together as a community, as a country. Everyone has to, to you know, want to be a part of it. Maybe Melvin, I'll get your take first. You know, how, how do you feel about this approach? Uh, uh, what do we need to do to create sort of that, that future Singapore that we all want? I think if a lot of the moves that we have done has been very much aligned with our own company's beliefs. The, the progressive wage model, I think that's one that is really moving uh, our com even for our company, mm. moving it forward. We have been slowly trying to move it up. And because, mm. yeah, because the issue for us, uh, we have seen over the years, uh, the or at least the part that encourages us the most is when our workers come back and say, thank you so much. My whole family is now finished right. their universities and they were workers before. Mm. So I think that we, we are rewarded by that feeling. Mm -hmm. and we are also rewarded with the loyalty. So we believe that mm. this scheme is going the right direction. Uh, for, so for the... Going further, I think the issue is, of course, uh, healthcare for adult, my older workers. Mm -hmm. It's increasing uh, very drastically for yeah. us. Uh, as they go older, we provide full healthcare yeah, beyond right. whatever is provided by Sorry? Do you make a conscious effort to include older workers? We, we, it's not a conscious, it's just that they are, they're still delivering the value. Right. It, they are slower in terms mm. of the actions, but they are not slower in terms of their, their poorer workers in any way because they have the skills. They, have, okay. they are craftsmen already, a mm -hmm. lot of them. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to create that class of craftsmen. Yeah. But the difficulty for us over time is the cost. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, the cost is moving up. Uh, we still have to take care of our, our staff. We still have to build their career path. Even their 60, 70, might have got quite a few people, uh, long service awards of 50 years or mm -hmm. 40 years old. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to figure out how do you take care of them as they age gracefully. They, they all tell us, you still want to work even on the wheelchair. I don't know if I can do that. Should we but, uh, <laughs> raise the retirement age even more? <laughs> Some people will be angry with me for that. <laughs> so, yeah, my question yeah. is, how, how can uh, companies or, or can, how can the companies work with the government to, you know, pre allow the, the old age workers to continue to work into their twilight years? Well, well first of all, I'm very happy that, Melvin, you have a uh, progressive mindset in, in, in creating the environment for all your workers, lower, lower income workers, as well as senior mature workers in your company. And we want more employers to embrace that sort of mindset. And then the government will work with employers to see how we can support employers. We already do with schemes like the senior employment credit, workfare for lower income. So effectively, mm -hmm. the government is bearing part of the wage cost for employers as it is for lower wage workers, for senior workers, to reduce the wage costs mm. for companies to employ more of uh, seniors and lower wage workers. Uh, but beyond that, of course, we, we do want to make sure that we take care of our seniors. We are looking at healthcare, how we can do better. And, and you know that, uh, and Emily will know this from uh, the healthcare sector, it's not just about treating them when they fall sick, but it's empowering them now with healthier SG to take yep. proactive steps to have your own family doctor, to get screened regularly, to have an active, healthy lifestyle so that you can delay the onset of chronic illness. And we are doing that through healthier SG. And then very importantly, as eventually all of us will get old, uh, we are starting to think about what we need to do for aged care which is different from healthcare. I mean, aged care means what are our care arrangements for seniors? Mm -hmm. What are our living arrangements? How can we allow and provide peace of mind for seniors to be able to live in uh, age in place and have security over their retirement needs, over their living arrangements. Right. That's something that we are looking at very and carefully. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, in fact, you know, the budget is more about the financial aspect of things, but money can only do so much, you know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think as we move forward, you know, we know we're working towards an, a more inclusive Singapore, one that we're all a part of, one that we can all build together. So unfortunately, we have run out of time. We've had a great conversation, so uh, we have to wrap it up there. Thank you so much, DPM, for coming in. Thank, Thank you, you to all our guests for coming, sharing your thoughts with us. And for all of you who have been joining us at home, thanks so much. This has been us, the Finance Minister. Goodbye.